This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I'm taught the Word of God, my life has changed for the better. And I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. If you would turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 26. We'll be dealing with Isaac today. And I have a testimony to share with you. I would have had Jessica read it, but she's not here with us today. And we've been encouraging you on your phone or notebook or journal, somehow, some way, to keep a list of all the miracles that God is doing in your life, all the answers to prayer. And there are, there are times and seasons, and there are seasons where there's a lot of answers, a lot of miracles. And then there are times in life where you're, you're like, well, when's my next miracle coming? But just having the list to look at will always encourage you. A lady in the church writes, this is long, but I need to tell it. For the month of July, I took advantage of several weeks of vacation time. It was the most productive five weeks of my life. I'm so grateful for my job, the wonderful team I work with. I celebrated 10 years with my company in January and was awarded a cruise and an additional week of vacation will take soon. At Faith Christian Center, we're expecting miracles, writing them down, telling them. Now that my to-do list is complete, I want to take a few minutes to share some of what God has done this year. Number one, our daughter has been healed of eczema. Anyone who knows her knows how that condition has plagued her. And so as I said, after we prayed, what God does for one, God will do for another. Amen, that's wonderful. Number two, I've been healed of allergies. I have not taken any allergy medication since April. This used to be a daily ritual. Praise God for it. Number three, I've not needed any pain medication since April. I've had alarming and unexpected pain in my feet and in my hips, but I started laughing out loud when, they, when it comes and then the pain goes. Number four, over and over again, my husband has had day after day of selling three or four cars per day. As awesome as that is, it has almost become normal. But on Wednesday, July 31st, he sold seven cars in one day. Seven cars in one day, praise God. That's unheard of. And this is not like some little lot in the country where it's like inexpensive stuff. This is high-end stuff in Dallas. So she writes, that's unheard of. A man in the church said that this would happen at a champion builders team this summer. My husband also made salesman of the month for July, which comes with a substantial bonus in addition to his record-breaking commission. Yesterday, we received notice that I was found not at fault on an insurance claim and will receive back a $500 refund on the deductible on a claim from February. And knowing the situation, knowing the insurance company, that is a bona fide miracle of God. Amen. That is what we have been believing would come in from Austin's message in February, pastors again in June. Number seven, while at camp, our daughter had an answer to prayer that has been on her heart for several weeks. She came away from Camp Change this year. Number eight, I found a $100 bill in a parking lot. Praise God for it. Amen. Number nine, my husband sold his 13-year-old used car with close to 200,000 miles on it for $7,000. That's a miracle. The guy drove in from out of state, paid cash, and could not get here fast enough. Our daughter has been babysitting this summer. She's been blessed in that. We've not been sitting around. We've been busy taking action on the Word. We're looking forward to the rest of 2019, continuing to plant and to water our seeds of faith, and we're expecting more miracles. Praise the Lord, He is good. God is our source, and we sow for God to multiply, and we expect miracles. Amen. Say, say that. Say, I expect, I expect miracles, miracles in my life, my life. in my family, and in my work, I expect miracles. Amen? As we've been learning, God's plan works. We just have to work the plan. 
As my father dealt with this past week in the special meetings, God's plan works. We just have to work the plan. And if we'll work the plan of God, every generation should walk in greater blessing. Isaac walked in greater blessing than Abraham. And over time, pastor preached on Jacob one night this past week. Jacob got off to a rough start, which is always encouragement, I think, for any of us, even if we've made some missteps, even if we've made some mistakes, even if we've done some things wrong, if you'll hear God and obey God and get going in the right direction, God can get you to where you would have been if you would never have made any of those mistakes. He's good. He's gracious. And so over time, eventually, Jacob walked in even greater blessing than Isaac. To walk in the blessing of God in your life, you've got to cross the line of faith. You've got to see God as your source. Say, God is my source. So see, God is your source, not any person, not mom or dad. You know, maybe you come from a background where you have a trust fund, not your trust fund, not, not the government. You know, we pray, as Paul said, we pray for our leaders. We pray for those in leadership at every level of government, local, state, federal, but we don't put our hope in that. I said, we don't put our hope in that. And you put your hope in that, you're going to be disappointed. That's called idolatry. So God is our source, not any person, not, not the job. We're thankful for the job, not the job though. He is our source, not the government. And God uses many channels of blessing, but God is still the source. He is the source of every blessing. And one way or another, when you walk with God, he's going to get your blessings to you. If he taps someone on the shoulder and tells them to be a blessing, and they say no, they don't cooperate, God will tap someone else on the shoulder. That's why you've got to confess that you're blessed, your steps are ordered, you're favored in everything you do. Now, if God is your source, don't live your life sucking up or hoping to get this or that out of any person. Be a God pleaser, not a man pleaser. When we walk with God, he is our source. So we live to please God, not people. That doesn't mean we go around purposely offending people. Some people take this the wrong way. But we live life knowing God is our source. I'm not looking to this person or that person. I'm not trying to brown nose this person or that person. I'm not trying to suck up to this person or that person. I'm not going to this lunch or that lunch hoping, hoping I might get something out of it. This is for somebody today. Have you ever done that? You've gone to something and thought you get something out of it and then got nothing out of it? So don't live your life that way. Say, God is my source. Cross that line of faith. See him, God. See God as your source and supply. And choose to believe God in his word. Like Isaac, choose to believe God in his word no matter what Philistines or uncircumcised Philistines might say. Choose to walk in the blessings of God no matter what anyone might say. This requires that we both be obedient and willing. Isaiah 119 says, if you're willing and obedient, and it can be either or, that's the problem. Sometimes we're obedient, but sometimes we're not willing. And sometimes we're willing, and sometimes we're not obedient. If you are willing and obedient. So we've gotta be both. And the best thing is in every area of life, to get obedient, but then to also get willing. Some people, they're obedient, but they're not really willing to walk in the blessing of God because of the heat and the criticism that it'll bring from others. And you just gotta get past it. I know, we all, we all wanna be liked. We all wanna have a bunch of friends. We all want everybody on planet Earth to think we are wonderful all the time, but that is not dealing with reality. And so no matter how kind, no matter how gracious, no matter how loving any of us is, everybody is not going to like us. Everybody is not going to be our best friend or best fan or BFF or whatever it is. There will always be somebody that has something negative or critical to say about us. And so you just gotta get past it and say, I'm gonna be obedient, but I'm also going to be willing to walk in every blessing God has for me, regardless of what anyone thinks. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the best of the land. If you're, the Living Translation says, if we're willing and obedient. If the Living Translation says, if you will only let me help you, if you will only obey, then I will make you rich. 
When Jesus performed his first miracle for a young couple getting married, which was a financial miracle, his mother told the servants, just do whatever he tells you. That's the key. It's obedience. We can, any of us can pull ahead in life by hearing God and by obeying God. Now today in Genesis 26, we're going to look at how Isaac received a financial miracle during a time of famine. You know, we are so thankful for good times. Praise God for good times. But any, anybody that's doubted into reality knows there are good times and there are not so good times. You know, history moves in cycles. There's economic expansion, and what comes after economic expansion? Yeah, contraction, recession. And if they really tinker with what they're doing, the, the word nobody wants to say, which is depression. But when we walk with God, we walk in His blessing and His favor no matter what times we're living in. Our blessings, when you walk with God and see God as your source, our blessings are not dependent on whatever is going on in the world's system. So today we're going to look at how Isaac received a miracle, a financial miracle during a time of famine. Now as we've been learning in this series, we can say it, we can do it, we can receive it and tell it to receive what we want from God, to receive what we desire from God, to receive our answer, our miracle. So step number one today, number one, God said it. God himself, Father God himself said it. Genesis 26, beginning in verse one. Now there was a famine in the land, besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time. And in ancient culture, when there was famine, it, it was bad. There wasn't food. There wasn't enough food to eat. It was a severe depression. There was famine in the land. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and will bless you. For you, to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. Now during times of famine, people would typically, in this region of the world, they would typically go to Egypt. And there was always typically food in Egypt because of the Nile River. But God told Isaac in verse 2, do not go down to Egypt, live in the land where I tell you to live. Now to the natural mind, this makes no sense. It's famine, you live in that region of the world, so where do you typically go? Egypt. That's what common sense would tell you. That's what doing what's best for your family and for your children would tell you. It's famine, it's bad times, so where are we going? We're going to go to Egypt, where there's food, where there's plenty, where there's provision. But God told him, verse 2, do not go down to Egypt, live in the land where I tell you to live. Now that made no sense, but as we've been learning in this series, that's why we walk by faith, that's why we walk by the word of God and not by sight. And to walk in the miraculous, to walk in supernatural provision, you've got to discipline yourself to walk by faith and to walk by the word of God and not by sight. That's what Peter did in Luke 5. They, they had worked, they weren't recreational fishing on Lake Grapevine. They, they were fishing for a living. And they had fished all night and had caught nothing, which in our terminology today would mean no money, no bacon on the table. Jesus comes along and says, go back out there and throw down your nets. What Jesus told them to do made no sense. Yet Peter told Jesus, because you say so, I will let down the nets. It didn't make sense. It didn't make sense to his natural mind, but he said, because you say so, I will let down the nets. So God has a part to play, and we have a part to play. Our part is to obey. Our part is to obey. When God speaks to us, when he puts something on our heart, when he puts something on our heart to do in any area of life, our part is to obey. And it doesn't always make sense. And a lot of times when God speaks to us, when God puts something on our hearts, it's short, it's simple, and it doesn't come with a big long explanation as to why and all the reasons why, and here's all that I'll do in your life if you obey. He simply tells us to do something. He simply puts something on our hearts to do, and it's a test to see if we'll listen and obey. Our part 
is to obey. Why don't we say that? Say, my part, my part. Is, to is to obey. Now, as we'll see, when you obey, here comes the blessing, but you've got to be willing to live in the blessing and not be ashamed of it. So God told him, verse two, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and I will bless you. Say, say God is with me. Say, say God is for me. Say, God loves me. And God is blessing me. Sometimes we're not convinced of that. He's with you. He's for you. He loves you and he is blessing you. And that's what he told Isaac. I will be with you and I will bless you. Blessing always follows obedience. Now there's a price to obedience. There's a cost to obedience. And when God speaks to you to do something in any area of life and you're obeying God, your eyeballs are wondering, well, I don't understand it. I don't see this paying off, but you've just got to obey him in faith and then the blessing comes. Blessing always follows obedience. Now in this time we live in, we would say it this way, we're to be led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus paid the price for us. He was risen from the dead. Right now he's seated at the right hand of the Father where he's praying for us. He is making intercession on our behalf. So the one who is here with us is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that he speaks by his still, small voice. We hear him here. And when he speaks, we have to listen. When he speaks, we're to be led by him. We're to follow his promptings. When, when you're out and about, maybe gassing up your car, and he, he moves on your heart to go speak to someone that's also there gassing up, to the, to the natural mind, you're thinking, I've got this to do, I've got that to do. They don't look too receptive, even though you haven't said anything to them. We start making all these excuses, and yet that still small voice is speaking to us, prompting us, encouraging us to do something. And it's not just in that area of life. He wants to help us in every area of life. We just have to listen. We just have to obey. We just have to cooperate. We just have to be led by him. Number one, as we've learned in this series, God said it. God gave Isaac specific instructions. Number two, step number two, do it. Isaac did it. Verse 12 says, Isaac planted crops. Now again, this makes no sense. Under normal conditions, when there's famine, do you plant crops? No. For those of you that know your history, the Dust Bowl here in the American South, you're in the Dust Bowl. Do you go outside and work hard for week after week planting crops during the Dust Bowl? No, it's gonna just blow away. But why did he plant crops? Because God told him to stay where he was and to go to work and to take action right where he was, and God told him, I will be with you and I will bless you. Again, didn't make sense to the natural mind, but God spoke to him and Isaac obeyed. God said it and Isaac did it. God said it and Isaac did it. He planted crops in that land, in the land that was in famine. Now that's exactly what Peter did in Luke 5. He heard what Jesus said. He believed what Jesus said. He did what Jesus said do. That's what the widow did in 1 Kings 17. She heard what Elijah said do. She believed what he said do. She did what he said do. It made no sense, but then there was supernatural provision. As we saw in this series, that's what King Jehoshaphat did in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. He heard what the prophet Jehaziel said. There's this vast army, bigger than you. They're, they're thinking they're all gonna be wiped out. Jehaziel says, go out to meet them, but put the praise and worship team in front of the army. That made no sense. I mean, as much as we are faith people, church people, Bible people, if, say, China declared war on us, and then our president tweeted that he had coordinated the worship teams of all the, the 10 biggest churches to, to go to the battle, we, we would all think he had lost his mind. <laughs> and that's us being in church and being faith people and believing the Bible. Jehaziel said, put them out in front. King Jehoshaphat heard, he believed, he took action. He did what the prophet of God said do. 
That's what the 10 lepers did in Luke 17. They heard what Jesus said. They believed what Jesus said. They did what Jesus said do. And they got, they received their miracle. So verse 12, Isaac planted crops in that land. What land? The land of famine. We can say it this way. Isaac went to work. Did you know work is spiritual? And that's why if you're born again, for work, you've got to do something that's godly. You've got to give up anything that's ungodly. You've got to give up ungodly ways of making money and do what's righteous. It's not the message today, but it, this is a part of it. It is a total package deal. He planted crops. We would say he went to work. You know, when you get up tomorrow and you go to work, you're doing something that's righteous. When you work hard to provide for your family and for your children, that is a righteous endeavor. And the Bible says that God blesses the, the work of our hands. God blesses our labor. Isaac planted crops. Isaac went to work. Isaac obeyed. He took action. He heard God. He obeyed God. So God said it. Isaac did it. And then he received it. Step number three, Isaac received it. Verse 12, he planted crops in that land, the land of famine, and in the same year. What year? The year, the year of famine. The year when things were not good. The year of recession, the year of depression, the year of famine, and he reaped how much? A hundred times. Now that's God, and that's the hand of God. I, Elijah, time of drought, he was fed by ravens. That's God. That's the provision of God. Isaac here, in a time of famine, he plants crops. Under normal circumstances, you, this is something you cannot do. It is not going to work. But he plants crops in a time of famine. And now, not only does he have a kind of good harvest, he has such a huge harvest, it is a hundredfold, a hundred times. That's God. That's the blessing of God. He reaped a hundredfold. Now, how did he do this? Verse 12, it says, because who blessed him? I know he got a raise on the job. The boss came through with a, a half of a percentage point raise. Is that how he, he got a hundredfold? Is that how he became very blessed? How did he become very blessed? Because who blessed him? He, he just kept going to that family gathering, hopeful that great aunt so-and-so would finally part with some money. Is that how he got blessed? Who blessed him? Who's the one who blesses us? Who's the one who hears our prayers? Who's the one who does for us what no one else can do? It's the Lord. He's our source. He's our provider. And I know it's so easy to get our eyes on this or that person. It's so easy to get your, your eyes on your manager or your boss or your job. But the Lord is our source. And he's the one who blesses us. And if the blessing doesn't come one way, when you walk with God, it's going to come another way. He's going to find a way to get to you what belongs to you by faith and what you're saying and what you're praying for and what you're confessing and what you're believing God for. He reaped a hundredfold. Why? Because he heard, he obeyed, and verse 12, the Lord blessed him. Verse 13, the man became, what's, what's the word? As I said at the beginning, every generation should walk in greater blessing, greater provision. You know, as a young man, don't feel so young now, 37, I should be listening to my father, studying my father, learning from my father, imitating my father, so I can do more or less, so I can walk in greater blessing or less. See, this is the vision that God has for his people in his word, that every generation ought to do better and walk in greater blessing. He became rich, and his wealth continued to grow until he became, what does it say? It's all right. See, religion gets us feeling bad about this. He became what? Very wealthy. God made him rich. His wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants, the Philistines envied him. And that takes us back to Isaiah 119. God's plan works. And when you work the plan, 
The plan works, so you begin walking in the blessing of God. And as you work God's plan at this level, God takes you to new levels. And as you work His plan at this level, He takes you to new levels. But if you think you're going to do that in your life without any criticism, yeah, I've got some bad news for you. There's going to be some criticism. There's going to be some people who have something negative to say. There's going to be someone who has a problem. It doesn't matter how much you smile. It doesn't matter how much you walk in love. You know, one of the kindest, most gracious ministers I've ever met is Joel Osteen. Yet there are people, and they hate Joel Osteen. There are people in the ministry, and they hate Joel Osteen. It's just envy, because he's more blessed than they are. But he's, he's, he is genuinely a nice guy. When he, when he smiles, that's not fake. That's really him and who he is. That's him and who he was before he ever stood behind a pulpit. But as nice as he is, there are people, and they hate him. There are supposedly born-again people, and they hate him. They can't go seven days without saying something negative or mean or critical about him. So for me as a young man, that's a lesson that no matter how kind we are, how gracious we are, how much we do our best to walk in love and speak the truth in love, as God blesses us, there's going to be some criticism. As God does miracles in our lives, there are going to be some people that have something negative to say or critical to say, which again takes us back to Isaiah 119. It's not just being obedient, it's being willing that as God blesses you, you're not going to be ashamed of his blessings. As God blesses you, you're not going to hide his blessings. And as God blesses you, what's step number four in this series? To tell it. As God blesses you, you'll be willing to tell others what God has done in your life. And as God blesses you, you'll be willing to give who all the praise? Who all the credit? Who all the glory? Well, that means telling it. Look what the Lord has done. Look what God has done. It's not me, it's the Lord. So you got to be obedient and willing. When will you know you're truly walking in the blessing of God? When other people take notice. When will you know you're truly walking in the blessing of God? When the Philistines around you take notice. Look at how they responded, verse 15. So all the wells that Isaac's father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up filling them with earth. Now what kind of wicked, wicked people stop up water wells in the Middle East during a time of famine? Wicked people. We live in wicked days. You don't have to be an expert in Bible prophecy to know we live in wicked days. Jesus said the last days would be perilous. We live in wicked, perilous days. They stopped up the wills. So he had planted crops. He had reaped a hundredfold in the same year because the Lord blessed him. So every generation ought to walk in greater blessing. And no generation of Christian young people should start from scratch. But why do so many Christian young people have to start from scratch? It's because of their parents not working the plan of God. Say this, say, it changes with me. Changes. Say, I'm working God's plan. God's plan. Say, my children, my children will walk in greater blessing. In greater say, my grandchildren, my grandchildren will walk in greater blessing. It's not just about us. It's not just about you and me. It's about our children. It's about our grandchildren. They're the future. Well, Austin, what if the Lord comes? Well, we want to be in heaven with our children and our grandchildren. Again, that's what it's about. And if he continues to tarry, we've got to raise them up to serve God in the last days and days that are becoming increasingly and increasingly wicked. And when I was a young guy, 15, 16, 17, 18, I knew wonderful Christian young people. And their parents were not a blessing to them at all. Their parents didn't help them at all. Their parents threw them out when they turned 17 or 18 or whatever in any situation was the number the parents had given them. And it, it was heartbreaking. That is not godly behavior. 
Now, if that happened to you, you've got to forgive and you've got to walk in love, which is not always easy to do, but you've got to forgive and you've got to walk in love. And then you've got a purpose in your heart. You're not going to do the same thing to your children. You're not going to repeat that destructive cycle. You're going to be a blessing. Say it, say it again. Say, it changes with me. It changes with me. Say, it's not just about me. It's about my children and my grandchildren. So I'm going to be a blessing. So my children and my grandchildren can walk in greater blessing. So God said it. Isaac did it. He received it. And then step four, this is interesting. His enemy told it. Isaac's enemy, Abimelech, told it. When will you know you're truly walking in the blessing of God? You'll know it. When even the people who don't like you, they're telling it. You'll know you're walking in the blessing of God when even the people that aren't your biggest fans, they're telling it to others. Genesis 26 and verse 16, Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Now notice that Isaac was blessed wherever he went. And why was that? Because God was with him and God was blessing him. Say that, say, God is with me, and God is blessing me. Say it again, say, God is with me, and God is blessing me. So you're at one company, and you're blessed, and maybe there's a change of management or whatever, and they're trying to get rid of you. Your source is God. So wherever you go to, it's gonna be better, and you're gonna be blessed. Why? Because God is with you, and God is blessing you. Verse 18, Isaac reopened the wells. Now, is this easy? When someone has taken wells and filled them with dirt and rocks and stone, is it easy to reopen wells? Yeah, we're, we're in Texas in August. Just try having an ice cream cone outside. Can you imagine being there in the, that region and trying to reopen wells. This is hard work. He reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stomped up after Abraham died. And this is important. Everyone who's young, let's just say 40 or younger, Isaac gave them the same names his father had given them. Now, young people, a great lesson can be learned here. Isaac didn't reinvent the wheel. There's great wisdom here. He didn't reinvent the will. He didn't do his own thing. He followed the pattern of his father, Abraham. He simply did what his father did. And he even gave the, gave the wells the same name. You know, I believe, you know, if the Lord tarries, I believe my father's going to be with us for a very long time. But when and if he did go home to be with the Lord, we're not going to change the name of the church to Hipster Christian Center or something. What are we going to do? We're going to keep doing what we've been doing. Amen. Preaching the gospel, teaching people how to live by the Word of God, to be doers of the Word of God, teaching people how to live by faith and not by sight. Why? Because that's the pattern. And it works. Amen. Amen. He gave the wells the same names. Young people, there's great wisdom here. See, we're, we're to learn from our elders. We're to listen to our elders. We're to honor our elders. And even if I told a young man once he was complaining, saying this or that about his father. I told him, I said, young man, I hear you. But you need to remember that no human being is perfect. And so you've listed all the weaknesses or what you perceive are the shortcomings of your father. But here, let me tell you some wonderful things about your father. He didn't look happy with me. Because then I rattled off a list of 10 things that were wonderful about his father. I said, young man... Your father is paying for you to go to school. I've known a lot of young people and mom or dad or family didn't lift one finger to help them. See, we, we need to be thankful. We need to be grateful. And anything we see as a shortcoming, we just need to keep our mouth shut and purpose in our heart to do better and to do better with our children and grandchildren. But we've also got to honor the pattern set before us. Joshua knew what he was doing. 
Moses knew what he was doing. Abraham knew what he was doing. And so Isaac figured it out. He gave the wells the same name. And pastor, my father preached on Jacob this past week. Jacob got off to a rough start. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. He was a thief. But when did his life change? It changed when he, as a young man, embraced the pattern of his father Isaac and the life pattern of his grandfather Abraham. So it's so simple. But see, we've, we've got to have humble hearts and not be rebellious. So you young people, to truly walk in the blessing of God, be humble. Honor your elders. Honor your father and mother. Listen to your spiritual leaders. Follow their example. Follow the pattern that works. So verse 18, he reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. Notice, he, he didn't cry. He didn't complain. He didn't get on Instagram and do a video showing how they had stopped at the well and how this was terrible. And he was doing a GoFundMe to, to you know, pay for water, to have water flown in. He went to work. They reopened the wells. They did the work that was necessary. He didn't tweet or talk about how the struggle is real. <laughs> yes, he faced opposition. But what did he do? He kept working. He kept obeying. He kept taking action. So there was a disappointment. Just go to work again tomorrow. Have a good attitude and just keep plugging away. So, so you thought something could have been better, should have gone better, should have had a better payoff. Just get up tomorrow morning, say this is the day the Lord has made and go back to work with a good heart and a good attitude and keep being faithful, keep being obedient, keep plugging away. Okay, so someone has something negative to say about you or someone criticized you or they don't like you or they're not your biggest fan or maybe they're actually hoping you'll fail. Welcome to the club. This is life. In life, if you are going to accomplish anything of significance, there will be opposition. What did Jesus say? John 16, he said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We sang that song during worship. He overcame, so we overcome. In life, if you're going to accomplish anything of significance, there will be opposition. But when you face opposition, don't quit. T tell your neighbors, say, don't quit. don't quit. Tell your other neighbors, say, don't quit. don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Point at yourself, say, don't throw in the towel. Don't throw in the towel. Tell yourself, say, don't give up. Don't give up. Just keep taking action. Keep working. Keep doing what's right. Keep obeying God. Keep being faithful. And if you'll do that, there'll come a day when even your enemies acknowledge God has blessed you. That's what God did in David's life. David wrote in Psalm 23 and verse 5, He prepares a table before me, where? In the presence of my enemies. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Genesis 26, verse 19, Isaac's servants dug in the valley, discovered a well of fresh water there. So Isaac and his men, they worked, and they kept, they kept taking action, and they prospered. They worked, and they prospered. What's the pattern? They worked, and they... They worked, and they... They worked, and they... That's the pattern. They worked, and they prospered. Verse 20, but the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, the water is ours. See what happens? More blessing, more opposition. More blessing, more static, more criticism, more envy, more opposition. Verse 20, so he named the well Essek, which means disputed, because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also, so he named it Sitna, which means opposition. So he's working, he's prospering, they're working, they're prospering, but more blessing means more opposition. You gotta be able to handle it. Verse 22, he moved on from there and dug another well and no one quarreled over it. So notice there comes a point when the opposition stops. Satan always talks people into giving up right before their breakthrough. That's why Paul said in Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time, say at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if 
And so you got to mark that in your Bible, circle it, star it, if we do not what? Now, how many people in life give up? They quit, they give up, they throw in the towel, or in the worst situations, they, they take their life in despair. Satan is a master deceiver and manipulator. Don't give up. Smile at your neighbor and tell him, say, don't give up. Smile at your other neighbor and tell him, say, don't give up. 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 Why? Because God loves you. God is for you. God is your source. God is your help. He's helping you. He's blessing you. So it doesn't matter what anyone else says. It doesn't matter what anyone else tries to do to you. He's your source. He's your help. So he, he's blessing you. He's favoring you. He's increasing you. He's working on your behalf behind the scenes. So that's the pattern. Work and then more blessing. Work and more blessing. Obedience, blessing. Obedience and then more blessing. But then with the blessing comes opposition. More blessing, more opposition, more blessing, more opposition. But then a beautiful moment comes when because you didn't quit, your critics and enemies will quit. They will be silenced by the hand of God upon your life. If you don't quit or give up or throw in the towel, the day will come when those who tried to hinder you or hurt you or oppose you, they will give up their opposition and they will acknowledge God has blessed you. Verse 22, he moved on from there and dug another well. No one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, meaning room, saying, now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. From there, he went up to Beersheba. That night, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. I will bless you and I will increase you. Say, God is blessing me. And God is increasing me. It's easy to say that when everything is going perfect. But when you get to work and find out someone stole one of your accounts or stole one of your clients or stole one of your sales, that's when you've got to get by yourself and say, he's with me, he's for me, God is blessing me, God is increasing me. And anything anybody tries to steal will be repaid seven times. So it cost the enemy to try and hinder or to hurt or to oppose. Notice that after Isaac heard, believed, and took action, then God appeared to him and spoke a new promise. God only appeared to Isaac and spoke a new promise after Isaac obeyed. Everybody say after. after. Too many believers go from one meeting to another, hoping for a word from the Lord when they will not obey God's written word and they will not do what God has already told them to do. It's a trap. And what that does is it opens the door to false words. Satan loves to get people deceived. He loves to get people off on wild goose chases. The power is in obeying the word of God. And the power is in doing what God says do. And in your work, and your family, and in your career, as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, and leads you, and guides you, the power is in cooperating, the power is in hearing, and obeying. Verse 25, so Isaac built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. So notice he acknowledged God was his source and he gave him the credit for it. Verse 25, he pitched his tent and there his servants dug a well. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, his personal advisor, and Fekul, the commander of his forces. Isaac asked them, why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? They answered, we saw clearly the Lord was with you. That's when you know you're walking with God. That's when you know you're walking in the blessing. You know, when people say, I, I don't understand it, I don't agree with it, I may not even believe it, but God is with you. God is blessed. That, that's not you, that's the Lord. That's how I pray many times. I tell the Lord, Lord, I pray that you would do such wonderful things that people would have to say, that's, that's God. That's not Pastor Gene, that's not Austin, that's not this or that person, that's the Lord. We saw the Lord was with you. Say, that's what God wants to do in my life. Where people tell me, God is with me. 
We saw clearly the Lord was with you. So we said, there ought to be a sworn agreement between us and you. Let us make a treaty that you will do us no harm, just as we did not molest you. Now, this is a lie. Just as we did not molest you. But they're lost, they're unsafe, so we can't blame them for lying. What, what do lost people do? They lie. <laughs> they're not good church-going folk. <laughs> lost people sin. Lost people do evil, wicked things. Lost people steal. They, they lie. They backbite at work. It shouldn't surprise us. We didn't try to, we did not molest you, but always treated you well and sent you away in peace. That's a lie. It's all a lie. And now we see you are blessed by the Lord. Now we see you are blessed by the Lord. Our job in faith is not done until even our enemies admit we're blessed by God. When will you know you're truly walking in the blessing of God? You'll know it when even your enemies tell it. How did Isaac receive this miracle, this incredible harvest, a hundred times what he planted during a time of famine? God said it, Isaac did it, he received it, and then even his enemies, they told it. How did Isaac do it? He heard and he obeyed. Say that, say he heard and he obeyed. He heard and he took action. He heard and he followed instructions. Let's lift our hands and say this. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you are with me. I thank you that you are for me. I thank you that you're blessing me and you're increasing me. I thank you that you're doing such a work in my life and in my family, in my home, and in my finances, and in my work that the people around me will have to acknowledge that you are with me and that you are blessing me and that it's you. It's not me. It is you. And it is your hand upon my life. In Jesus' name.